As we prepare our hearts and minds to hear God's word, we begin with a time of prayer. Our first prayer is for our own hearts and minds that God, the Holy Spirit, would guide us to hear his words clearly and effectively, that we would grow in our faith and love for Jesus. Our second prayer is for our brothers and sisters in Christ that the Holy Spirit would calm any fears or worries or stress that they have in their hearts and minds, so that they would hear God's word and be comforted and encouraged by the gospel. And finally, I ask that you would pray for me that I would preach God's word clearly and effectively and that the gospel would be proclaimed properly proclaimed this morning. Psalm 19 says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. As we celebrate the good news of Palm Sunday, you can grab a Bible and open it up to Luke chapter 19 as we see the story of the triumphal entry, and then later on, we're going to look at what Paul says about Jesus in Colossians. But in the triumphal entry, it's beautiful that we call it triumphal, because if you look at the story, Jesus hasn't done what yet? He hasn't gone to the cross yet, and he hasn't risen from the dead yet, right? That's coming later in the week. And yet, what we call what Jesus does on Palm Sunday is the triumphal entry. He's entering as our king. And the response that we do on Sunday is we have palms and we shout Hosanna, we sing hymns of praise, and we celebrate the good news. This is our king, our savior, our Lord. And the crowds back then did the exact same thing. They gather around, they see Jesus coming in on a donkey, and they begin to grab palm branches and wave them and put them in the road to make a red carpet for him and say, this is our king who has come to save us. In fact, in Luke's gospel, it even says, blessed is the king, right? They are celebrating that he is our ruler, he is our reigner, he is our Lord, And that all sounds wonderful until we mess it up, which is like what we're best at as humans, right? Anybody ever had something really great going, whether it was a party, a celebration event, and then you or someone else ruined it? No, you all have perfect parties. (laughs) No one ever said something weird, awkward, right? Like, we, we know that, like, oh, wow, look at how good things are going. And then a lot of times what do we do is our natural instinct is, what's going to go wrong, right? When, when is it going to mess up? Well, here's the deal. When the people are worshiping and praising Jesus, and they're calling him the king, and they're waving the palm branches around, and they're shouting Hosanna, and on the surface, it all sounds wonderful, We even repeat their words, right? We shout, Hosanna, and we shout, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king. We do all the things that they do. So where did they mess up? Well, about 150 years before Jesus enters Jerusalem as this king that gets welcomed with palm branches and shouts of Hosanna, there was a man named Judas Maccabeus who led a revolt against the Seleucid Empire, who tormented and persecuted and tortured God's people, and he won for the Jewish people their freedom. And they were able to now worship God and restore the temple and praise him. And so what Judas Maccabeus did is after that victory, he took the palm branch and they began to embroider it on their clothes and their coins as a symbol of God's victory. So Jesus shows up, and his disciples gather around him about 150 years later, and what do they begin waving around and using to praise him? Palm branches. And then they begin to shout, Hosanna, which is a word that means, Lord, save us. God, save us now. And they're shouting this, and they're praising him, and they're worshiping him. 
but there's a little problem with what they're doing, which we'll find out later on during Holy Week as everybody begins to abandon him. Is they were praising him as the king, they were shouting Hosanna, they were saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're quoting the Bible when they do this, right? We'd all say these are what? Good things, right? That's what you're supposed to do on Palm Sunday, okay? And yet, what we know is that in their hearts, most of them, what they are wanting is Jesus to do what Judas Maccabeus did and overthrow the Romans. So here's the, here's the issue that we have to ask ourselves about our own hearts, is what kind of king is Jesus to us? For many people back then, he was a revolutionary. For many people back then, he was a political king that was going to change the government and set some new things up, right? And here's the deal, because Ecclesiastes says there's nothing new under the sun. So before you get all judgy, judgy about the people back then, be like, oh, they didn't understand Palm Sunday the way we do. We still have, just like they did, sinful hearts. We still have hearts that get it wrong when it comes to Jesus. So often we want Jesus to be our version of Jesus. Have you ever encountered this in the world, right? People will say, well, my Jesus isn't like that. My Jesus wouldn't do that. My Jesus wouldn't do this. My Jesus wouldn't say this. And then everybody's favorite is when you mix it with politics, you say, my Jesus would vote this way. My Jesus would never vote this way. My Jesus would like this candidate. My... Anybody else ever get sick of that stuff? Or is it just me? Right? We know this still happens, right? We want to say, my Jesus, he's going to be king. We'll say all the right words. He's Lord, he's Savior, he's king, just like they did, right? But then the classic Lutheran question is, well, what do you mean by that? Right? Are you really worshiping Jesus as he is? Or are you trying to make him into something that you want him to be that benefits you? See, in this story, when Jesus shows up, on the surface, it looks like they're getting everything right. They've got the palm branches saying, Jesus is here to bring us victory. And that's true, he does bring us victory. It's called Good Friday and Easter. They're shouting, Hosanna, Lord, save us. And that's absolutely true, right? Jesus does save us. It's his cross and resurrection. And they're shouting, blessed is the king. Jesus is our king. He is the ruler and reigner over all things. So the issue isn't the words they're using, right? The issue isn't the traditions that they have. The issue is the same issue it's always been throughout scripture, which is our hearts. Do we worship Jesus as he reveals himself to be for us? Or do we do what many people in the crowd did, which is say, Jesus, you can be my king, and you can be my Lord, and you can be my savior, as long as you do the things that I want you to do. As long as you rule and reign in the way that I want you to do, as long as you save me from the things I want you to save me from. And here's the problem is that just a few days later in Holy Week, almost every single one of them will abandon Jesus, including the apostles. And here it becomes why? Why would they do that? Don't you see, like, a week is not a long time, right? Anybody think a week lasts a long time? All right. right, it goes by fast. You know what goes by really fast for pastors? Holy week. It's like the fastest week in the whole world. <laughs> but just think about it. We here on Palm Sunday, the whole crowd is doing what? You are a king, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We got the palm branches, you're bringing victory. And then by the end of the week, every single one of them will do what? Abandon and deny Jesus. Why? Well, he wasn't the king that we wanted him to be. He didn't be like the savior that we wanted him to be the savior like. 
He's not ruling and reigning over us the way we wanted him to rule and reign over us. See, the issue isn't the words or the traditions, right? The issue is what is going on in our hearts, just like them and just like us today. Another way of putting it is you can very easily go through the motions, right? You can very easily say, I did the thing, I said the words, there we go, I'm, I'm good. But what's really at stake with Palm Sunday and Holy Week is, is Jesus your true king and your true savior and your true Lord? Or are you trying to mold him and shape him into something else that he doesn't want to be? This is what's at stake is the identity of our savior. It's not just did I say the words, did I shout Hosanna, did I sing the right hymns, did I get a palm branch? Some of you are really creative and can turn those into crosses, right? All those things are wonderful, but it's not what matters most. What matters most is that we shout Hosanna, we welcome and praise our king and celebrate his victory, his triumphal entry with hearts that are found in faith, not just going through the motion. So if you turn in your Bibles to Colossians chapter one in our epistle reading, Colossians chapter one, we're gonna start at verse 15. And what Paul's going to do for us is reveal to us who Jesus is. Right, uh, St. Augustine said that if you have figured God out and you can to tell everything about who God is and all of his glory and all of his eternality, that it's not really God that you are worshiping, but yourself, right? And that's our issue is that when I make Jesus, oh, oh, he's king, but as long as he's king the way I want him to be, oh, he's savior, but he's only savior in the way that I want him to be, then I'm no longer worshiping Jesus. I'm worshiping myself, what I want as a savior and as a king, but in Colossians chapter one, beginning of verse 15, the apostle Paul is going to tell us, this is who your king is. This is who the Jesus that we celebrate and shout Hosanna at, the Jesus who had the triumphal entry, this is who he is. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. So what Paul is saying is, Jesus has come into the world, he has taken on flesh, he's having his triumphal entry to show you and me in all humanity, this is what God is like. Because if you haven't figured it out yet, God is really big. Anybody learn that in Sunday school when you were real little? Right, God is really big. And by big, I mean so big, you will never figure him out all the way. You will never be able to wrap your arms and your mind around and go, this is the fullness of God. So here becomes the question that God's people ask throughout the centuries. Well, how do we approach him then? How do we have a relationship with this eternal, infinite, holy God? And the answer that God gives to us in John's gospel is Christmas that Jesus comes as God in the flesh to dwell among us. And John's gospel says, we've seen the fullness of God in all of his glory and in all of his grace. And so Paul's saying, if you want to know who God is, you look at Jesus. And what are we celebrating about Jesus on Palm Sunday? We're celebrating that he has come to be our king and be our savior. Verse 16, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. So what kind of ruler and king is Jesus? He's the one who rules over all things, is what Paul's saying. There's not a single area of the universe or existence that Jesus, our king, is not ruling and reigning over. And then Paul says at the very end of verse 16, and it was all created for him. So what does that mean? That means Jesus is the one who is supposed to be 
worshiped and praised and glorified, which is why at the end of our gospel reading, right, the Pharisees show up because they don't want to cause any trouble, and they tell Jesus and the church, y'all need to be quiet, right? Now imagine that, a church service where everybody is so loud and praising the Lord that the neighborhood is like, can y'all keep it down for a minute? Just think about it, it'd be kind of cool. We could pop the windows open, make a ruckus for the Lord. And what does Jesus do? He looks at the Pharisees and he says, oh, yeah, you're right. We don't want to upset anybody. No, what he says is, if they be silent, if they are quiet, then the very rocks, the very stones of the earth will raise up and begin praising and glorifying me. Why? Well, that's what Paul is saying in Colossians 1, verse 16. All things were created through him and for him. When we say Jesus is the king, when we say he's the ruler and reigner of all things, we're also saying he's the only one worthy of our worship. So that's a heart question. Is Jesus the only one worthy of worship in your heart and in your life? Now, it's kind of a mean question because the answer is no for every single one of us. We would like him to be, but he's not. We call it idolatry, right? Every time I worship, pursue, seek something else or someone else or anything in this world, whether visible or invisible, and say, that's my highest priority in life, that's the thing that gets my attention and my desires and my passions and my glory, guess what I've done? I've replaced Jesus as my king, as my ruler and reigner in my life. Martin Luther put it this way. He used to say that whatever your heart turns to for comfort in your moment of need, that is truly your God. So now we all realize I've got idols in my life. I've got false gods and false kings in my heart because when I'm stressed out, I will confess to you as your pastor, I don't always turn to God in prayer as the very first thing. A lot of times I order a pizza. That's not a joke. You could ask my wife. She'll come home and she still leaves a big old pizza there, half eaten. She goes, did you have a bad day? I'm like, yeah. Now, it's kind of humorous on the surface, right? But it's not humorous when it comes to my heart and our conditions of our hearts. We can shout Hosanna. We can shout blessed is the king all we want. But Paul is saying he is not just the creator of all things, but all things, including you and me, were created for who? For him, for his worship. That's why he's like, even the rocks are going to praise my name. And so when we shout Hosanna and say Jesus is our king, the question is, do I really mean it in faith? and in my heart? Or are there areas that I need to repent of and say, I've made these things higher than they ought to be. These things have become my comfort. They have become my solace. They have become the ones that I shout Hosanna to. Will you save me from this stress, from this anxiety, from this fear? Rather than saying, Jesus, will you be the one that comforts me and saves me? Is hope. We can say the words all we want, but what God's word, what Paul is calling us to is saying, but you also need to go through repentance and say, I've I've got these other kings, I've got these other rulers, I've got these other things that I worship and shout Hosanna to, will you be the thing or the person that saves me rather than Jesus? In verse 17, St. Paul goes on, he says, and he, that is Jesus, is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. So he is before all things, meaning he's above, he is first place, he is primary over all things in the entire universe. When you and I shout, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, blessed is the king, on Palm Sunday or any other time in our lives, that's what we're supposed to mean. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords, and there is no other. And then here comes another fun question for all of us. Verse 18, he is the head of the body, the church. Which means 
He's in charge of what? It's right there. It's right there. I just read it for you, right? He's the head of the church, right? Which means, guess who's not the head of the church? Guess who's not in charge? Guess whose church it doesn't belong to? All y'all and me, right? I'm not the head of the church. Who's the head of the church? Yeah. Whose church is it? Who's in charge of it? Good, we're all in agreement. So let's repent. Isn't that what Paul wants us to do? He's the head of the church. So we say, oh, he's our savior. He's the Lord. Yeah, of all things in creation, including and most specifically his church. It belongs to him. He's the ruler and the reigner of the church. Right? So He's the one that's in charge. He's the one that has all the authority. He's the one that's telling us, here's what it means to be a church. Here's how I want you to live. So again, going back to the Palm Sunday crowd, what did they do on Palm Sunday back then? They grabbed their palms. They shouted, Hosanna, save us. They shouted, blessed is the king. You, you are it, Jesus. You're our savior. You're our Lord. You're our king. It all sounds great. It's a wonderful worship service. They're so loud, they get in trouble. And yet, by the end of the week, what's going on? They've all done what? They've abandoned him. Some of them are probably part of the crowd shouting, crucify him, in fact. Because they were like, oh, well, we wanted you to be our leader, but not in that way. Right? It, it is very easy when I've got you trapped here <laughs> to say, Oh, yeah, Jesus is the Lord and the King. It's his church, right? He's the one that's in charge of the church. It belongs to him. It's very easy to say that right here and right now, right? Because that's what the Bible says. It's what Paul's saying. We're all in agreement. Oh, this is wonderful. And it's also very easy for us to lose track of that to live that reality out in our lives together as a congregation and turn it into, well, this is my church. I should be in charge here. I'm the one that should make the decisions. And we go, oh, we would never do that. Well, the crowd on Palm Sunday never thought they were going to abandon Jesus and say, oh, well, we don't want you to be our king in that way. We don't want you to be our leader in that way, right? And are there times when you and I are guilty of this within the church of saying, Jesus, you're the head of the church. It's your church and we all belong to you. You're our shepherd, you're our leader, you're our king, right? All things that we would agree upon. But are there times when we say, but I don't want you to lead me like that. I don't want you to shepherd me in that direction. I don't want you to guide our church in this way or in that way. I want you to do it my way. And then he goes on in the second half of verse 18. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So Paul is saying he is the creator of all things. All things are meant to glorify him. The church belongs to him. And then he's telling us, and here's why he should be preeminent in the whole world and in your life and in the church. The short answer is Good Friday and Easter. See, why, why should the crowd shout Hosanna? Why should they worship him as king and say, you are our Lord and you are our savior and you are our king? And even though they got it wrong at first, Paul is saying, here's why we do this. Here's why we call out to Jesus to be our savior. Here's why we worship him as our Lord and that we praise him as our king. It says, because he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. He is the reason you and I have hope. 
right? He is the whole reason we have salvation. It is because he is the one who has risen from the dead. He has saved us from the greatest enemy of all, which is death, the consequence for our sin. And Paul's saying, if you want a reason to shout Hosanna to him, if you want a reason to worship him as Lord and King and Savior, it's because Jesus has risen from the dead. And then the verse 20 says, he has also made peace between us and God by the blood of his cross. The reason we should shout Hosanna to him, which means save us now, Lord, is because he is the one who really does save. In fact, he's the only king that saves. If you just think about it for a while, you will realize that all the other kings, all the other saviors, all the other objects, possessions, desires, people in your life that you have shouted Hosanna at, they have all let you down. You know why I know that? Because we continually keep shouting Hosanna at the next thing, and the next thing, and the next one. And Paul is saying, if you want peace, where you don't have to keep worrying and living in fear, if you want peace, where you don't have to keep shouting Hosanna over and over and over again at one thing after another, then shout Hosanna at Jesus, because by his blood, by his cross, He has made peace for you, and he has given you salvation. So why the heck do we call him our king? Why do we celebrate him with palms of victory? And why do we shout Hosanna to him? It's because he is the one who has given us peace by the blood of his cross, and he is the one who has risen from the dead. He is the only one who has given us the salvation we really need. So as we enter into Holy Week and we shout Hosanna and we celebrate and welcome the triumphal entry of our King, I want you to keep that truth in your hearts and minds, that this is why Jesus really is our King. This is why he's really our Lord. This is really why he is our true Savior. It's because of his blood on the cross and his resurrection from the dead to give you and me peace and life. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks that you indeed are our King, our Lord, and our Savior, that as we come to you in faith, worshiping you and praising you, that we do so knowing that you have given to us peace and forgiveness and salvation through your cross and death and through your resurrection. As we enter into Holy Week, may that continually be our focus, the work of salvation that you came to do, to be King of kings and Lord of lords and our eternal Savior. In your name we pray, amen.